Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer of WebMD. Over the past two years, we've been talking a lot about trust. Who can you trust? Dr. Fauci, your primary care provider, your neighbor, that Facebook or Instagram friend who seems to have a lot of followers? Medicine can be hard to figure out, even when you're a doctor. Helping me to think through how to evaluate health information you read online is my friend and colleague, Dr. F. Perry Wilson. He's an associate professor of medicine at the Yale University School of Medicine and host of Medscape's Impact Factor. He has a new book out, How Medicine Works and When It Doesn't, Learning Who to Trust to Get and Stay Healthy. Well, Perry, congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much. I'm excited about it. Now, there's no doubt that the physician-patient relationship has eroded. And you talk about that in the book. But how did we get to this point? It just wasn't because of COVID. No. In fact, I started seeing this long before we had any idea about COVID. It's been our failure as, as a medical system and as people who you know provide care within that system that has left so many people behind in some ways, that fails to address some of the really deep needs that our patients are suffering from that has left them vulnerable to this because people are getting desperate. And so I think this, this started, this distrust of medicine honestly began as medicine became more commercialized, as, uh, as you know, insurance companies and profit-seeking health systems um, started coming between doctors and patients. And they've really driven us apart and driven some of our patients into the arms of an all-too-willing crowd of people that might be taking advantage of them. Perry, I have a copy of your book here, which I really enjoyed reading. And there's a great quote. I want to read it back to you. You say in your book, one of the ways to hack trust is to give an impression of certainty. Health is never clear cut. Nothing is 100% safe. Nothing is 100% effective. Anyone who tells you otherwise is selling something. So what's going on here in terms of this issue of certainty? Don't people know that up front? Oh, I see. I, I don't think so. Um, and, and you see this in many different ways. You see this when people are looking for second opinions in medicine, something I encourage all of my patients to do. You know, don't don't just listen to me. Talk to other doctors. What you'll hear sometimes is these stories of, you know, I went to Dr. So-and-so and he said, I know exactly what to do and this is going to make you better and I'm going to do this and you will get better. And that is incredibly reassuring. And for a patient, especially, you know, if a patient who's in pain or has a diagnosis that is scary, terrifying, or life-threatening, that reassurance um, builds this bond of trust. But it's fundamentally untrue. The other place we see certainty hack trust, and this is probably way uh, more important than, you know, a second opinion from another doctor, is in social media. Social media rewards certainty and punishes nuance. It's those extreme positions that get retweeted and shared and amplified. And so we live in a world that gives the false impression that to be right, you have to be sure of yourself. And good medicine is not about being sure of yourself. It's about being honest with yourself and your patient and talking through those unknowns. Yeah, I think this is better for you, you than do not that? taking. Oh, it's hard. How do you do that in a 15 minute interview? We can't be giving all these caveats to patients, right? Well, it only works if you do this, this, but not that, and it's a 10% chance of this or 30% chance of this. Don't patients want their physician to kind of pull it all together for them and make those recommendations? Absolutely. As physicians, we need to be honest. We need to say, yep, there's a variety of choices here. Nothing's perfect, but my recommendation based on my years of experience and training is this. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If you're interested in one of these other options, let's talk about that. That's fine. But we also have to ask our patients to be aware that they are being sold bills of goods from other providers who may not be physicians or nurses or you know in the traditional healthcare sphere at all. There are people selling ideas, selling 
some are selling products, but but things that might be dangerous to their health, and they're selling them with the promise of certainty. And so part of what I want to do is tell people to warn people about that, because, hey, if you get a bad diagnosis, all you want is to be told that it's going to be okay, right? I, I understand that, like, we all get that. But we also have to be honest with ourselves and realize that there are people who are going to take advantage of that desire. Perry, one of my favorite chapters is titled The Temptation of the One Simple Thing. Tell our viewers what you mean by that. Yeah, one simple thing, medicine. So so you, it, once you have this in your head, you'll see it all the time. One simple food you can eat to lose 10 pounds by you know New Year's. Uh, one uh, simple exercise you can do to have shredded abs. Um, you know, one simple medication you can take to prevent you from having a heart attack. There is this meme out there, this trope that a very simple change can dramatically affect your life. And the truth is with with rare exceptions, most things aren't that simple. And yet we're all looking for those quick fixes because change is hard. And one of the major themes that I address in the book and that I talk with patients about is that if you want to change your future, if you, you know, you're heading down a path, you want to change your future, you need to make changes in your life. And one simple thing is not enough of a change. You need to change, most of us, myself included, need to change multiple things. I call it developing your health portfolio. All of those things that you do, that you sort of are investing in yourself, those healthy behaviors to give you that good long-term future. And just like, you know, there's no stock that you can buy that's going to triple your money over the next two weeks, there's no one simple thing in medicine either. But isn't that predicated upon the concept of hope? Patients are hopeful. They want to be able to lose weight. And, and maybe they're looking at too simple a solution. So whose fault is that? Is that the fault of physicians? Is it fault of the general healthcare community? Where would you place the blame? The reason one simple things get pushed out to people um, is oftentimes because it's a simple thing that you can buy and someone is selling that simple thing. Um, and hope is critical. And this is not just a feeling I have. Um, this has been well studied that people, for example, with terminal diseases who have more hope, even accounting for how serious their diseases live longer. So it is a powerful force and it's something doctors need to give to their patients. But false hope isn't helpful. So yeah, people have hope, people need to have hope that they can lose weight. We just need to tell you, absolutely, you can lose weight. Yes, you can, you can do this. And here is what we need to do. Here's how you need to invest in yourself to do that. But it's going to take some change. And people are so resistant to change. They don't want to do it because we're creatures of habit. And we will look for any way to avoid change that we can find. And if someone says, look, you don't have to change what you eat. All you have to do is take this pill and you'll lose weight. That's that Great. sounds pretty and good. It sounds it sounds awesome, and that's why it sells uh, it sells pills. But I think we owe it to ourselves and to our patients to be honest and say there's more to it than that. There's you know there's no there's no uh, free lunch. No pun intended. But because you mentioned earlier, nothing is a hundred percent certain. The challenge for viewers is that one day high intensity interval training is good for diabetes. The next day, it's not so good. And, and your book's entitled How Medicine Works and When It Doesn't. W without giving the answers away from your book, what are the top two or three tips that you would give viewers as to how they view medical and health information that they might read online or even hear from a friend? In the old days, they hear it from their neighbor. Now, they see it, see it online. Tip number one is to recognize motivated reasoning in yourself. This is where people get lost a lot. Now, motivated reasoning is when you, there's a conclusion you want to reach and you search for the facts that support that conclusion as opposed to taking all the facts in. We all do this all the time. It explains a lot. In the online age, any data point you want is out there somewhere. If you want to believe for some reason that, you know, avoiding red dye number five will 
cure your cancer diagnosis, you can Google that and someone's written about it somewhere. Like there is some data that you can plug in to that belief. And you've got to recognize why you want to believe the thing you want to believe. And you won't be surprised that the usual reason people want to believe a certain fact is true is because if the fact is true, they don't have to change their lives very much. Number two is to be wary of what I call biologic plausibility. There's a lot of things that make sense from biology and can sound very scientific. So, you know, you, you can say, well, uh, uh, chocolate contains a certain chemical. And when we put that chemical on cells in a Petri dish, they, uh, they grow more slowly. And therefore, because cancer is the excessive growth of cells, chocolate should be used to prevent cancer. And, and there's a line of logical reasoning there. And they, I even said Petri dish. So that's scientific, right? That is the beginning of the process of science, not the end. So we have to start with something that could be, Jay, that might make sense. Then we have to test it. And a lot of where people go wrong is they say, oh, that kind of makes sense. I see why that would work. And then they go and do it, even though it hasn't been tested. And the history of medicine is littered with things that were very biologically plausible that when put to the real test, and the real test, maybe this is point number three, is to look for randomized controlled trials. When put to the real test, they fail, or in some cases, they actually turned out to be harmful. Perry, where can people learn more about you and your new book? A uh, personal blog is at www.methodsman.com. And I'm on Twitter quite a bit, um, at F. Perry Wilson. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel, uh, at F. Perry Wilson. So uh, once a week on those places, you'll see uh, my discussion of a new medical study. And of course, um, the first place you can see that is on medscape.com uh, on my column, Impact Factor. Well, Perry, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, John. This was fun. Mm -hmm.